How many kinds of sweet flowers grow in an English country garden? Daffodil hearts, ease and flocks, meadow sweet and lady smocks, gentine lupin and tall hollyhocks, roses, foxgloves, snowdrops, forget me nots. Do we just let this song play? Or just, it's, it's pretty doing good. Doing all of our work for us. I, I want to know how many of those you can eat. Well, uh, a good majority of them, actually, but there's one in there that I would say absolutely do not eat that one, and that's foxglove. Okay. So they did mention that one. That's one to stay away from. It's a beautiful flower. There is some medicinal value to it, but not likely in the quantity that, I mean, just you, you got to be careful with that one. But great intro. Thank you. That was awesome. And it, it also kind of dives into a little bit of the caveat. It's like, I'll know, although there are many edible flowers, uh, they can also be sprayed with pesticides. You got to really pay attention to your source. Make sure you're getting it from a source that's growing them or starting them with the intention to eat it. Because if it's been grown with only the intention to look good, it's likely got those systemic pesticides we talked about before. And then make sure that you're not eating from an area that might have other types of pesticides that have been sprayed around. Because just like your food source, you don't want to be eating the pesticide, you want to be eating the food. And flowers in particular, if you're, if you're spraying pesticides on flowers, they soak up the pesticide a lot more than their fruits do. You can't just wash it off. And so you want to make sure that you're using more natural type pesticides or deterrents that uh, would be more conducive to eating the thing that you're, you're spraying. And the other thing, too, is like when you pick a flower and you're going to eat it, make sure to kind of blow it off at least a little bit or rinse it off. I mean, some of them don't wash well, but uh, just to make sure there's no extra bugs or protein you didn't anticipate for your, for your meal there. You don't want to eat the bugs? No, the <laughs> bugs are not so uh, tasty. <laughs> but the, a lot of these can be very tasty, and there's a lot of use. So on our edible flower guide, you can get it at agriscaping.com. Just sign up for our newsletter. You also get access to a free membership. And in that free membership is the edible flower guide that you can print out for yourself. And there's a wealth of information on there. I'm going to go through as many as I can just to kind of share with you so you can see the variety of things that are growing, especially right now. I mean, summertime, we got the amaranth we talked about before. You got beautiful colors, reds, pinks. And uh, it's a spring plant that kind of blooms in the summer, very spinach-like leaf has a lightly sweet flavor of the flower cluster. That's kind of my favorite part. It's got a lightly sweet flavor. Uh, beautiful in salads, stir fries, uh, or as even as cut flowers, because they are a beautiful cut flower, and grow in um, multiple microclimates. So a B, C, and an A, which is really the hottest areas of your garden, can still grow an amaranth. And you have it listed here as an annual. So does that mean I can cut it and it'll come back? I can cut it, it'll come back? Or... Well, in an annual, in this case, it's only gonna it's only gonna grow for a season, and then it's gonna really die back. These things will die back in the winter time. They have kind of a hollow stalk, very similar. They grow very fast and very tall. There's some varieties of amaranth that'll grow eight eight to ten feet tall, and there's others like Love Lies Bleeding that actually let it's more hangs on the ground and has these beautiful trailing clusters of flowers of beautiful red color. Um, and so these ones, I'll grow it through the spring and summer. I'm going to cut it out in the fall and plant something else. But they do reseed themselves pretty well. And the little shoots, you'll actually find amaranth seed is a wonderful seed. So it's not just the flower, the seed that you end up getting, wonderful, healthy grain alternative, you know, a gluten-free grain alternative that you can pop like you could, uh, you know, uh, popcorn, uh, makes a, a fun little kind of little puffed treat. Uh, or you can also take that seed and then replant it. And then the shoots is one of the best, am uh, best uh, what do they call it? The, the microgreens is amaranth microgreens are very delectable, wonderful thing that you can eat. So other ones, we got bachelor's button or the cornflower. It's another annual one that's not going to be there all the time. Uh, it's got some plum colors to blues, even to white it's a fall plant with a spring bloom, grows about 12 to 24 inches tall, also great in salads, garnish, and stemmed decor, you know, putting that in a nice little vase and things like that, a little on the medium size. Uh, mild flavor, light texture, holds up its shape really well if you wash it or put it in other things so it can handle even mixing it into dishes and things like that. It's a pretty fun one. Bee Balm's the first on the list that we've got that is actually a perennial, so it'll grow year-round got purples, reds, and pinks, and even whites. It's a summer blooming flower. The petals are the best. Uh, it's got a mild sweet flavor, and it attracts hummingbirds and butterflies. So, you know, that's one of those that you can throw in drinks, you can throw in salads, you can put it in even um, ice cream as kind of a little add-on in an ice cream that works pretty well. And uh, so there's a lot of great stuff. Um, 
We're getting into Celosia season, which is like a dwarf amaranth. A lot of people plant Celosia, don't realize that that's edible. It's in the same family as amaranth, but they're like dwarf amaranth. And um, there's a lot of Japanese varieties and stuff as well, kimonos, that uh, have a little bit more of a bittersweet flavor in their flower cluster. So we lend it. We tend to lean more towards the the savory items and places that you can put that or as garnishments, stir fries, so it does hold up well even with some heat and keeps its color pretty well. And it it's one of my favorite uh, replacements of croutons. If you don't want to have croutons in your salad, but you still want something to kind of soak up a little extra uh, salad dressing, the Celosia is actually one that does that pretty well. For a lot of these annuals, you know what I'm picturing is your buddy – Billingsley, his Flower Street Urban uh-huh, yeah. Garden, you know, systems just being the perfect place to grow these. They are great, and that's a great place to grow, especially anything that's under a foot tall. Uh, if you got it more than a foot tall, you can only put them in the top row of Alex's Flower Street Urban Gardens. But they look beautiful when you put them up there. It's like I don't even—I haven't seen one before, but I wonder what uh, amaranth growing, you know, eight feet tall above a wall would <laughs> would look like. If you really need to shield a second-story neighbor, that might actually work. <laughs> your your privacy flower at your privacy edible screen. Yeah, there you go. I mean, one, another another one of my favorite ones, not so much a good screen, but a good ground ground growing plant in the in the through the summer months is the daylily. Now, there's some varieties of daylily, the whole flower you can actually put uh, they they serve them as delectable uh, hors d'oeuvres, you know, in high-end restaurants. They'll have uh, stuffed daylily flowers. And they are amazing. My wife, one of my her favorite flowers, it tastes kind of peachy. It tastes like a peach. So it's almost juicy. The petals and everything about it uh, is is what we eat on those. And there's purple, reds, pinks, yellows, a lot of amazing color. You can add them to drinks. I mean, they're just beautiful. The petals themselves, um, those aren't ones because they're so pretty. It's like we don't juice these ones. You know, we want to just eat the whole thing. You know, or use it like, uh, yeah, put some compote inside of there, make a nice uh, hors d'oeuvre stuffed with some cream cheese, kind of filling with some herbs in it and stuff would be amazing. Now, on a couple of these, it, it lists drinks. Mm-hmm. This it would be like adding mint is yeah. what I'm picturing. Not, yep. not like you're juicing it to drink. You're adding it as a, a garnish. You're adding it as drink. a garnish to the drink. adds a little bit of flavor to it if you can kind of steep it with it. I mean, like lavender, that's a good one that's a little, little deeper in the list. It's like a lavender lemonade. So you make the lemonade the day before. You throw some of your, le- your lavender flowers into your lemonade with a couple of sliced lemons and let it just steep overnight like on your, on your counter before you put the ice in. And it'll, it'll infuse the lemonade with this wonderful lavender essence. And uh, it's, it's got a wonderful flavor to it. And then you add the ice and stuff and kind of locks it in. And now you've got this wonderful chilled uh, lavender lemonade that you can have. So that's another way of using these drink ones. I love it. It's great. Uh, uh, Dianthus, that's another great one, has a little bit more of a peppery flavor. We just eat the petals on that. That'll grow almost through the entire summer as well. I've got it as a fall to winter bloom, but they they can extend their season pretty long. Beautiful flower, and it's important too. Another cool thing about eating flowers is by eating the flowers and pulling them off and eating them, you're actually uh, exciting the flower, the plant itself, to grow more flowers. I mean, some people call it deadheading. We'll usually pick the flower for eating just before it's dead. So as it just starts to wilt, like the pansy flower, just starts to curl a little bit, doesn't look its prettiest. That's when I'm going to pull that off and I'm going to eat that. And uh, and then it'll make the, it basically helps the plant say, hey, we need more flowers. And it'll just pop out more flowers for you. What's that tree that when you kill it, it shoots, sends all the roots off? It oh, sounds like the sisu uh, tree. Yeah, it sounds like the, <laughs> the sisu of the flower world. There we go. But most flowers, they benefit from that, and you do too. So it's not like the sisu where we don't really benefit from <laughs> it's It's sprouting itself back up. Another great one during the summer months, the hollyhock. Very beautiful, tall, growing flower. That one has a great stem, uh, good root builder uh, right there too. Uh, pinks and reds and oranges. There's even double blooming ones that look almost like roses, like tall, upright roses, great cut flowers, um, stem decor. I mean, you can stack them. If you've ever seen a hollyhock, it's it's like a pioneer flower. It's one of the most um, valued pioneer flowers because you can just scatter the seeds in an area. They grow themselves very well. They leave great soil behind, uh, especially if you just cut them out. They'll, they, they create these nice hollow channels where the water can w- move a lot deeper, create a lot more microbial activity. So it's a great um, great flower for a precursor to your fall garden. So if you've got a hard area in your yard that you'd like to grow uh, this coming fall, uh, hollyhocks, sunflowers, amaranth, great ones to seed in now and let them grow up. 
uh, because they'll start digging that soil for you without much effort. Now, a lot of these color-wise, red, pink, orange, yellow, pretty consistent. But you've got lavender here on here, which is one of the few that brings in the purples and the blues. Yep. And and it is tougher to find the the purples and the blues in the flower world in the edible space. I mean, there's plenty of purple flowers out there that uh, aren't edible. But in the edibles, and it's really important, I think, to stick to the flowers that you know are edible. So get this get this guide. Uh, highly recommend just getting this edible flower guide for yourself. These are a lot of the top flowers. They, we've got pictures in it as well as helping you know exactly where to plant them, what they'll do best, what time to plant them, and, uh, and, and giving you that flavor profile so that you're not overly surprised. Like the nasturtium is a bold, spicy flavor with a hint of honey. And you need to know that it's spicy before you eat it because it looks like something that might be sweet because of how pretty it is. But it's one that definitely on the spicy side and it will surprise you if uh, even the leaves are spicy. But that one, ironically, is my favorite one to put in um, to put in ice cream. Oh. So good friend of mine, uh, Chef Brad, if you've ever seen any of Chef Brad videos, he does a lot of work with grains and ancient grains and wonderful stuff. I mean, the sourdough world loves this guy. The, you know, every, so he loves to get into the nasturtium. That's one of his th- favorite things. He made a nasturtium ice cream that I got to taste, and it was amazing. And oddly enough, as it gets cold, the uh, ice, as it's in the, it keeps its color, it keeps its structure. So you have this beautiful pop of oranges and reds and yellows. Uh, it holds that, but then it loses that spiciness just enough that you don't, it's not overtaking or overpowering. It's got this wonderful, interesting flavor. So a, a vanilla type base or a cream base with the nasturtium is a wonderful, fresh, homemade ice cream that you might love and enjoy. <laughs> and you've got pansies on here. That's a pretty commonly grown flower here in Arizona. Yeah. Yeah, especially in the wintertime. I, I never thought of eating one, but <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> I've planted plenty of them. That's good. And it's a top one on the list. And along with petunias, that's another one. It's got a velvety texture. So not not everybody loves velvety texture on their tongue. So that's another one that it's nice to note that it's it's uh, it's got a little fuzz to it. and uh, But it is a semi-sweet. We find that the lighter the color in the world of the petunias, the sweeter the flavor. So the white ones tend to be the sweetest. And as we get into the darker colors, like the blacks, we find them to be more bitter. And if you think about um, food coloring, it, it follows a similar pattern. The more food coloring you often drip into your thing, whatever you're creating, it's going to have a bitter taste to it. And it's similar in the flower world, the, the darker the petal or the deeper the color, the likelihood of it being a little bit more on the bitter side is higher. And if it's got a lighter color, a lighter, you know, it's got a little less of the pigments and the pigments are the things that make it a little bit more on the bitter side. So those are just a few of them. You can get this entire edible flower guide at agriscaping.com. A snapdragon, sunflower, viola, violet, sweet are also all on the list. 